Hello and welcome to Afternoon Briefing here on ABC News. I'm Patricia Carvellis. Coming up, Victorians told to embrace the new normal of wearing face masks. And what can the latest coronavirus figures tell us about the spread of the virus? But first, here are today's top stories. Today, hundreds more cases and another coronavirus death in Victoria. The state government hopeful the numbers will decline. All these different steps that we're taking uh, will be to stabilise these numbers, drive them down uh, and get us beyond this second wave. New South Wales at a critical point. Health authorities try to determine the origins of new COVID-19 clusters. And changes loom for job seeker and job keeper payments ahead of the federal government's coronavirus budget update. The Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews says the state is yet to turn the corner in its fight against the spread of coronavirus. Another Victorian, a woman in her 80s, has died from COVID-19, taking the state's death toll to 39. There were 275 more cases recorded in the state over the past 24 hours. 147 people are in the state's hospitals, with 31 of those in intensive care. Victoria recorded 363 cases yesterday, but Mr Andrews says it's too early to be optimistic about today's lower number. Is a wicked enemy. Uh, it's it's it is unstable, and until we bring some stability to this, we won't. I don't think be able to talk about a trend. I'm certainly much happy to be able to report a lower number than a higher one. Uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that I know uh, a day in this pandemic feels like a month. Uh, we're, we're all very clear on that, uh, but we still haven't yet reached the two-week mark. It won't be until. Uh, Wednesday, I think, that we get to the full two weeks of the stay-at-home orders across all of Metro Melbourne. Queensland has recorded one new case of coronavirus overnight. The state has a total of 1,072 cases, with two of those currently active. The Premier, Anastasia Palaget, says the case isn't a concern as the person who tested positive was on a cargo vessel that is now being monitored. Queensland Health was notified about the case over the weekend and the person was quarantined on board before being taken to hospital. We were notified, my understanding, was over the, over the weekend. Health went out there. Um, representatives from the health department went out, did the testing and uh, this person was uh, quarantined on the ship and then was brought uh, to the hospital. So that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Our protocols keep the cargo ships out at sea um, for a length of time. They don't come into shore until they've um, met their quarantine standards. But because this person um, is uh, positive, uh, they have been taken to hospital. The former leader of the Victorian of the no, Greens, rather, Victorian Senator Richard Di Natale, who's come out to argue Victoria should retain the restrictions until the rate of community transmissions is reduced to zero, joined me a short time ago. Richard Di Natale, welcome. G'day, Patricia. Why do you think Australia should move to an elimination uh, policy in relation to COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the difference between an aggressive suppression strategy and elimination strategy isn't vast. Really, it's a question of how long do you keep these restrictions in place. And what we saw with uh, the example of other states, even though it wasn't the intended purpose, we saw that the disease was effectively eliminated from states like uh, Tasmania, Western Australia. And we've seen also the same success in New Zealand. So I think, look, to cut the government both federally and at a state level some slack. Um, we've got some of the big decisions right uh, early on in the course of the pandemic. The move to restrict international travel and to close borders was an important one. So I think we've made some of the tough calls early on and got them right. Now we've got an opportunity to have a shot at eradication. What that means is really keeping the current set of restrictions in place until there's no more community transmission. And if we do that, if we do it properly, then what we do is actually give some certainty uh, to the economy. We, we ensure that uh, we don't go through this cycle of lockdowns, uh, see uh, an outbreak occur somewhere else and then have to do the same thing again. So I think there's a good argument for going for an eradication strategy, remembering that it's really just an extension of what we're doing now. Well, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Nick Coatsworth, has written about this, and he says that suppression of COVID-19 is working. 
but a strategy of elimination is unrealistic and dangerous. Why don't you agree with the experts in the country who say that if we go down the road that you're suggesting, it could even be dangerous? Well, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that there is, I think, some disagreement within the expert public health community. You've got people like Stephen Duckett, the former secretary of the Federal Health Department, uh, Professor Bill Botel, uh, and, and others who have called for an elimination strategy. Um, I think uh, the Deputy Chief Health Officer's uh, concern was more a semantic one. I, I think it's fair to say uh, when you're talking about elimination in the absence of a vaccine, you can't ever be sure that uh, the virus will be kept out of Australia. What we're really talking about is keeping current restrictions in place until there's no more community transmission. And what that does is it means you don't go through the cycle of intermittent lockdowns. It's absolutely worth the shot. And as I said, we have achieved it in other states. It's been achieved in New Zealand. In New Zealand, we saw you know, tens of thousands of people gather to, to watch the rugby. Um, the the if effect of this is if we can keep uh, community transmission levels to zero, then we can allow businesses to continue to go on and operate. We can give people some certainty about what the future looks like. So, And the difference isn't particularly... Uh, you know, it's not vast compared to what we're doing now. We, we effectively are saying you keep the same restrictions in place, but you do it until you limit community transmission to zero. But let's be realistic. We are currently in a second lockdown in Melbourne, and that obviously, you know, people know what the restrictions are. Mm. It's restricted, but it's not level four. Do you think in Melbourne, where the numbers have been much higher than in other places across the country, we need to be moving to level four restrictions to try and get this under control? I think what's more important, Patricia, is firstly the issue of masks, and I'm pleased that the direction has come out to make masks compulsory as of Thursday in Victoria, and I'd advocate that everybody, uh, when they're going out, should, uh, should use a mask if they can. Uh, I think it's uh, a sensible precaution to take. I think what's much more important than stage four, because it's only a marginal step up from where Victoria is at the moment with stage three restrictions, is the length of time you impose those restrictions. So at the moment, the Premier said six weeks. The question is, at what point are we going to ease those restrictions? And I think if we get close to eradication uh, within the community, then it's worth... And I think if you take people in your confidence and explain to them that if we have this for a few more weeks, the benefit is that we may not need to go through another lockdown. We, we have some long-term certainty. Taking people into your confidence, I think, is really important. And, and I think the, the public would be with us if we made this step. OK, but when you say another couple of weeks, you've got to level with people. It's a lot more than yes. just a couple of weeks. Uh, six oh, weeks... we don't know. No, we don't, but it could be up to six months of restricted movement. And we know that this is having a huge impact, not just on business, on mm. jobs, on employment, on young people and school, on education, on mental health. I could go on. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, you've got to make an analysis that, about that risk, don't you? You sure do. And it's a very, very serious set of restrictions that have been imposed on people. It's bloody hard for a lot of people, Patricia. I suppose the question isn't whether you uh, have uh, the current set of restrictions and then go back to normal, because under the current scenario, if we were to ease restrictions, and we don't know how long these will last for, the six-week period is really just a, an initial time frame. At the current set of restrictions may go on for months. We have to be honest about that. Um, but the question is, do we want to be returning to this cycle of ongoing lockdowns into the future? So that's really the scenario. Do we give ourselves a shot at eliminating this now from Victoria and potentially New South Wales? If we do that, we actually get long-term certainty at the moment. If we return back to, you know, normal activities and there's still ongoing community transmission, the risk is that we find ourselves in this position again and again and again. You mentioned masks and now they're mandatory outdoors. You know, there's, it's worth looking up. I'm not going to go through all the details, mm. but one of those reasons that you leave the house, you have to be wearing a mask. Do you think there should be a nationwide rule? Well, I think in Victoria it's absolutely critical. Uh, and I think that we are in New South Wales. It, it may not be long before we do that. And my advice to people would be if you're going out in public, it's a good idea to wear a mask. Uh, particularly if you're going into an area where there's significant community transmission. Now, I'm not going to, again, I, I, it's not up to me to make a, a nationwide recommendation, but I think what you're seeing is the public health community move in that direction. Early on, there was some concern that we might not have enough masks 
uh, and therefore we might not be able to give frontline health workers access to the equipment that they needed. And we saw that the national medical stockpile was woefully inadequate and we just didn't have what we needed uh, in preparation for this pandemic. We'll certainly learn that lesson. But I think if we do see cases in New South Wales continue, it would be a sensible addition, I think, to the toolkit to recommend that people do wear masks. We know that people face uh, having to pay fines if they're not wearing masks. Of course, policing has increased in relation to adhering to these COVID-19 restrictions, particularly in Melbourne and the Mitchell Shire. What do you make of that policing or the policing strategy around all of this? Look, I hope there's some common sense applied. Uh, I, I don't think we want to be heavy handed. And I, look, there's a broader principle here, and it's that if you don't take people with you, if you don't take them into your confidence, if you don't take them, talk to them about what your long term plans are and what the overall strategy is, um, then you don't get the sort of support you need. And I, I have to say, I was really worried when I saw the uh, approach to the lockdown in the Melbourne public housing community. What you really want to do is you want to work with the community. You want to bring those community leaders on board. You want them to have ownership of the strategy. And that's when you get the best results. So community engagement's absolutely critical here. That's why having making the strategy explicit right from the start, uh, working with people so that they understand what the aims of what we're doing right now are, common sense policing where you're not using this heavy-handed approach and, and, and you'd hope that the police are using some common sense because... If people start to feel that they're being, you know, victimised and attacked, then what you're going to you're going to see is very counterproductive. People need to own the response. We all need to buy into it, and you do that by making your strategy clear and by really investing in that community engagement. Investing in that community engagement. Do you think at this stage? there's been too much of a focus on the policing, that that, that approach has been problematic? I think it has been a top-down response. And in the early phases, look, again, you've got to cut people some slack. I think the overall response in Australia from a public health perspective has been pretty good. There have been some terrible mistakes. Uh, Ruby Princess, uh, we saw what happened in quarantine here in Victoria. It's what happens when you go and privatise essential services. We saw the impact of that. But overall, we've, we've done pretty well. As I said, I think there's a tendency, though, sometimes for leaders to, to think that they need to have all the answers to jump in and, and have these top-down approaches. That can be counterproductive. So you've got to, you do have to work with people. Another good example is in the research area. It's been a lot of research uh, um, investment uh, into things like vaccines and medicines, very little going in towards what are the right behavioural strategies. Often those pieces of the puzzle are more important. How do we make sure our messages are working? How do we make sure people are engaging in a way that means they understand the scale of the threat and the sort of response we need? Just finally, I know there's a Black Lives Matter protest organised for Sydney and the police commissioner there has been critical of it. Is this the right time to protest for mass protests? Well, what we do know is that there haven't been any cases of significant community transmission associated with protests. So... Uh, you know, often it's an opportunistic response by some people who don't agree with the cause uh, of the protest. I think what's important here is that people take the necessary precautions, they ensure that there's physical distancing, that people wear masks. Um, but let's not forget there are some critical social issues here that need to be addressed as well. And oh, there's no doubt things... about it. There's no doubt about it. It's a very important issue. But the advice is still that mass gatherings should not happen, even outdoors. And, and as I said, I think if... Uh, if, the, if physical distancing is practised, if people are wearing masks and taking all the right precautions, there's no evidence of uh, mass community transmission in that context. What's much more important is focusing on how do we get people to engage in the high-risk scenarios that we know exist. Uh, wear masks when you go out in public. Uh, let's make sure that we're working with the community. Let's see some common-sense policing. Let's ensure that the leaders within various groups who have been targeted at the moment uh, understand what needs to be done and are part of the response. And if we do all of those things... I mean, Australians have behaved incredibly during this, and it's, it's really, I think, heartwarming to see the concern that people are showing for their fellow human beings, for vulnerable groups. Um, and if anything good comes of this, I hope it's that we uh, recognise what's important in life, Patricia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's former Greens leader Richard Di Natale.
New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian says she remains concerned about the spread of COVID-19. 20 new cases have been diagnosed in the state overnight, all from known sources. Ms Berejiklian says while the law limits household gatherings to 20 guests, people should act cautiously and follow health advice and keep gatherings to 10 people. We have had 20 new cases overnight. Uh, the one positive to take out of those 20 cases is every single one of those is from a known source. Uh, whilst uh, I remain incredibly concerned, uh, that is one positive takeout that all the cases now are from known sources, which means that people are taking advice and we need them to continue to do that. Please make sure if you've been told to isolate at home that you spend 14 days at home. Even if your test comes back negative, if you've been told to stay home 14 days, you have to stay home 14 days. Tasmania's health authorities are investigating a suspected case of coronavirus. The Premier says the suspected case is in hotel quarantine in the state south. He says further tests are required to confirm the case and that more information will be made available as soon as possible. Tasmania currently has more than 600 people in hotel quarantine and nearly 1,000 people in home quarantine. I've said to Tasmanians on many occasions that uh, we will see positive cases. Uh, importantly, uh, this one has been picked up in our hotel quarantine and as I've said, it's suspected at the moment there are further tests to be done and then we'll have more to say. But we are in a good place compared to uh, certainly Victoria, uh, New South Wales uh, and the challenges that they are facing, you know, our borders have um, stood us in uh, good stead and it's important that we continue to maintain those strong border arrangements. Professor Tony Blakely is an epidemiologist at the University of Melbourne and joins us this afternoon. Thank you so much for your time. How yeah. should we interpret the latest case numbers in Victoria? The Premier was very clear, said there's no evidence that we've turned the corner. In terms of the trend, should we be worried? Oh, we're all very concerned than myself. I think one way to understand this is think there's actually about three different epidemics happening at once here. There's the epidemic amongst the first 12 postcodes that were shut down then amongst the rest of us, and then there's also this epidemic, I think, happening amongst our construction workers and other essential workers. You put those three together, and it's a flat top. It's like we've gone up a table top, and we're walking across the top and waiting for it to come down because those things have happened in series. That's how I'm understanding it, because it is very flat at the moment. OK, so we're waiting, walking across the table top. I like how you yeah. did that. <laughs> When can we get off the table? <laughs> well, a seven days incubation period, three days for it to pick up a signal and the notifications and then it comes down. But if my theory is correct, and it is a theory, those construction workers, I'm sorry I'm picking on construction workers today, but there's also other essential industry. If they're out there and then they're driving around in the utes around Melbourne and transporting the virus around, that could go on for quite a while. Although if they all wear masks well, we'll see that turn it around. Or if Premier Andrews decides to selectively call it a day for a couple of weeks on a couple of these essential industries. OK, and that's what you've been saying. Let's get into that, uh, because we have a partial lockdown, but as you say, uh, the definition around what is essential and what can open um, has been, you know, defined in a way that some people are critical of. So what, sh what should be shut down to kind of get the case numbers down, in your view? OK, let's pull back. You do a hard lockdown for one of two reasons. You're going for elimination, which I strongly advocate for, or your ICU capacity is under threat. So to go for a hard, blunt lockdown and cut down all those essential industries, I support that for elimination or protecting ICU. That would be the people out there even doing the Uber stuff, the department stores, the Bunnings of this world, all shut down and we go hard for six weeks and see if we can achieve elimination. We published a paper in the Medical Journal of Australia urgently on Friday showing that a stage four lockdown, about a 5% chance of eliminating after six weeks, but you add on the mask at 90%, you're up to nearly 50% probability of getting elimination. So that's a good strategy to do. However, if our politicians are not game to go for elimination, and we're not gonna see that happen because they're not gonna take the leadership, then you should really only be doing a hard lockdown if your ICU or health services are under threat. So you're still pushing, as you just said, for this adoption of an elimination policy. Realistically, is that achievable? Or what kind of timeline 
would you need to do that? Because in some ways we missed the first opportunity that that's yep. now gone. We're now into this second phase. How long would we need to be restricted to realistically be able to say we don't have community transmission? Yeah, it's a good question and that's a tough one. As I said, this paper we did on Friday, we were right up to date, modelling done 48 hours before it was published. After six weeks of hard lockdown, we would see a nearly 50% chance if we did the hard lockdown plus everybody wearing masks. But now that we're starting the mask two weeks into our six week lockdown, those timelines would push out. So I can't guarantee, nobody can guarantee that elimination strategy would work, but it's a chance that we could go for by extending, say, six weeks out to eight weeks. Yes, that would be tough. It would be economically very tough for people, socially disruptive, but there's a chance of getting beyond that and into an environment where we don't have the virus circulating and we're functioning like WA or New Zealand, which would be a, such a better place to be in. The Deputy Chief Medical Officer Nick Coatsworth said that suppression of COVID-19 is working, but a strategy of elimination is unrealistic and dangerous. What's your response to that? Because that's, I mean, that's the official medical advice, not political, but medical advice being handed to the federal and state governments. Well, I disagree, and I think it's lacking vision. Um, New Zealand demonstrates it can work. Six out of eight states and territories demonstrate it can work. Taiwan, same population of Australia, have achieved it. It is achievable, but it would require more leadership than what we're seeing at the moment, and it's not guaranteed. I'm not standing here saying we can do it with 100% probability. I'm saying we can give it a good go, and we should therefore embrace the lockdown and go hard. Why didn't we tell people to wear masks earlier? Uh, I can't answer that, Patricia. Should we have? <laughs> yes, two weeks ago. When we first started throwing the postcodes here into lockdown, that would have been a good time to have done masks. I think the reason we haven't done it is twofold. Again, the political leadership, because the Canberra leadership, if you like, had been vested in the, in the advice not to wear masks that it wasn't necessary. It takes a while to back down from that. You know what it's like when you've got it yourself in that position. It's hard. And the second one is that it's not a culturally appropriate thing at least perceived to be culturally appropriate for an Anglo-Saxon country like New Zealand, uh, like Australia to do that. However, I bet you two weeks, 10 days from now, next Wednesday, if you go into a supermarket in Melbourne without a mask on, I bet you a lot of people will be asking you to put it on. I think we'll see a very rapid cultural shift here. I went on a jog with a mask today. It is possible. It's not easy, though. No, I went on the bike ride for my dog and my glasses got fogged up. Yeah. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Look, how about other uh, elements of what we're keeping open? Year 11 and 12 specialist schools, should, should they be perhaps restricted? What's your view? It's very contentious. <laughs> well, again, it comes down to what you're aiming to do. If we're going hard for elimination, then they need to shut. Because the schools, you know, the kid can bring it in from their family, give it to another kid that goes back up to another family. It causes those chains of transmission. However, if we're going to go for this aggressive suppression, I wish we'd do smart suppression, then you could probably leave those schools open. So it depends on your strategy, and obviously I'm advocating at the moment for elimination. If we stick with suppression of coronavirus, and you mentioned how difficult it is to back down, well, clearly uh, suppression is still the strategy. What would living with it look like? Will this lockdown, uh, you know, lockdown, lock up... <laughs> Was that the kind of pathway we'll be on until we get, um, we get a vaccine? Yeah, so I'll put my suppression hat on. We'll talk about that. <laughs> well, so that's what currently the policy. <laughs> <laughs> so what it would look like is we'll probably be going in and out of something like stage two or stage three lockdown. I think that's what we've had to accept. Until such time as we get smart... The masks may help us because they are not an economic cost on anybody. You can still go to the supermarket or to Bunnings if that's where you want to go. And so that may be our little out clause here is if everybody wears masks, it may allow us to live a bit more normally. But frankly, I can't see us for at least six months not having this yo-yo phenomena in and out of some form of lockdown if we're only going to suppress the virus. This virus just keeps bouncing back. It certainly does. Let's just talk about New South Wales because it seems if you look at their numbers today, of course, they're higher, but, you know, they feel like they've got a handle on it in terms of the contact tracing and that strategy of just stamping it out when you think it's um, starting. Do you think they've got a handle on it? I was encouraged by today's numbers, but let's be clear, I'm watching the numbers of locally acquired that they don't know where they got it from, and it's gone from about three each day to none today. So that's not a big difference. That could just be chance. 
But nevertheless, if it was going pear-shaped, I would have expected those numbers to keep going up. So maybe they've got control of it. What we learned from Victoria, though, is that we could not control an outbreak coming out of quarantine, for example, with contact tracing, mass testing and strong surveillance systems. That was the strategy we invested in. That's also the strategy that New South Wales invested in. So hopefully it works. We'll have to see, but with, still with those number of cases, I'm very nervous. Mm, yeah, it's a de de definitely a very nervous time. So if we go for this mask strategy and you told us about your modelling and what you think it can produce, is that something that should be adopted nationwide? You mentioned the cultural issues, this Anglo-Saxon kind of vibe. We don't wear masks. Uh, I live in Melbourne, you live in Melbourne. We're wearing masks now. I'm not wearing one on television, neither are you, but I will when I'm not on television. What is, you know, we can change the culture. Should we change it across the country? Well, let's go through that a couple of steps at a time. First of all, people need to be wearing masks in Melbourne and Mitchell Shire and anywhere in regional Victoria where there have been cases and also around those outbreaks in New South Wales. Beyond that, if you're living in WA, always the example I use, there's no reason to wear masks at the moment medically because there's no virus out there. But if we wanted to go for a mass cultural change, I guess we could, but I think that's probably jumping the gun. I think it's probably more important that Melbournians and Victorians demonstrate it can be done. People in those hot areas in Sydney demonstrate it can be done. And then you have stockpiles ready to go. So if it suddenly jumped into, I don't know, part of Brisbane, there would be masks out there to those suburbs within 24 hours. I think that's the strategy to take. So how long do we need to wait to see whether this new compulsory from, well, it's from Thursday morning, Friday, uh, Wednesday night, compulsory mask situation with all of the other restrictions might be effective before yeah, the government question. needs to consider that next stage fall. Yeah, OK, so we went up the hump mountain before the tabletop and we had those epidemics. So they're all going to come off soon. So we should see the numbers coming down because they've been effective. But the masks themselves will kick in in about 10 days to two weeks' time because they'll become compulsory on Thursday, seven days for incubation period, about three days to pick up the signal with the changing numbers. So it's going to take until, what's that, next Wednesday, two weeks' time. So would, is your, and now I'm asking a kind of policy question, but you can, you can handle it. I know you can, Professor. Uh, does that mean no lockdown for realistically until the government sees whether that's been effective? Ah, uh, if I was Brett Sutton and Premier Andrews, if the numbers kept on going up, I would be moving towards stage four lockdown if our ICU capacity was threatened or if I'm going to go for elimination for those two reasons. But I do support Premier Andrews on his line by line review he announced yesterday going through these essential industries because some of our industries out there, I think construction workers are one of them. I'm picking on them today. Sorry to those people. But I think they are propagating the epidemic because they keep moving around Melbourne. There may have to be some targeted workplace and worker restrictions in the next week or so, depending on that actual hard data epidemiology inside Vic DHHS. Uh, thank you for allowing me to pick your big brain. Um, it's always a wonder, wonderful thing to talk to you generally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. I hope that was useful. It was wonderful. Professor Tony Blakely is an epidemiologist at the University of Melbourne. Sue Lannan joins us now with Finance from Sydney. Hello, Sue. A warning uh, that hundreds of thousands of businesses could fail. What's this about? Yeah, this is from Deloitte Access Economics, PK. They crunched the numbers from the Bureau of Statistics and also figures from the federal government looking at the impact. Firstly, of course, you've had the big subsidies, lots of government stimulus measures that you've been talking about, JobKeeper and JobSeeker and also loan repayment and rental holidays. So the Deloitte say that, in fact, if these measures are withdrawn at the end of September, then something like 10 per cent of Australian businesses could fail. So they base this on a number of 240,000 businesses in hospitality and professional services and transport and also Victoria really in trouble because they do receive a lot of the JobKeeper payments as does New South Wales. So we know that uh, federal government is saying these payments will be suspended, uh, extended. We don't know the extent. So Deloitte has done the analysis ahead of the announcement this week. So they're saying it really uh, bodes badly for the economy and that uh, especially creditors, suppliers, insurers also should get ready for uh, a wave of insolvencies. Also a warning from the investment bank UBS. They said, say about 18% of small and medium-sized business loans have 
being put on hold at the moment. That's about $100 billion. And they, they say if that amount is not extended into more lo loan repayment holidays, then expect a second wave of unemployment. And how did the local market uh, trade? Yeah, of course, we're seeing the rise in coronavirus cases in Victoria and uh, stepping up a bit also in New South Wales. So the market did end lower. Wasn't too bad. Ended down by about half a percent. Did come off the lows at 6,002 for the ASX 200. But we did have most sectors in the red. Mining stocks, tech stocks are among the few bright spots. spots. But oil very much leading the market down and the big banks. Now, of course, oil falling because of the rising coronavirus cases around the world and the big hit to global demand, PK. Thanks, Sue. That's Sue Lennon with the latest finance news. The judicial inquiry into Victoria's COVID-19 hotel quarantine system is now underway in Melbourne. The inquiry has heard that two dozen government agencies and private entities have already been asked to give evidence. Authorities say hotel quarantine breaches were a key source of outbreaks in Victoria, which have led to five million people in Melbourne and the Mitchell Shire being locked down for at least six weeks. The senior counsel assisting the inquiry says it's been suggested that every case of COVID-19 in Victoria in recent weeks could be sourced to the hotel quarantine program. Comments made by the chief health officer to the media have suggested that it may even be that every case of COVID-19 in Victoria in recent weeks could be sourced to the hotel quarantine program. Those assisting you are in the process of obtaining the necessary material and documents and witnesses to put before the board on that very issue. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison says its important parliament continues to sit during the coronavirus pandemic. Politicians were due to return to Canberra for two weeks in early August, but the session has been cancelled on advice from the acting chief medical officer. Scott Morrison says that decision was a no-brainer, but he expects parliament to return for the end of August sittings. Continue to, to manage these issues carefully and exercise our responsibilities carefully. We know how important it is for the parliament to meet and to sit. And uh, I think there is also somewhat of a consensus across certainly the major parties that it's important that it sit in person. Uh, that is an important part of how our parliament functions. And we would be seeking to do that uh, when the parliament net sits, which is on the 24th of August. And, uh, I would hope that we will be able to sit on that day. It is certainly my expectation and planning that we will be. The Deputy Chief Medical Officer Nick Coatsworth has confirmed there have been 296 new cases of COVID-19 recorded in the past 24 hours. 275 cases are in Victoria, 20 are in New South Wales and one has been recorded in Queensland. One more person, a woman in her 80s, has died from the virus in Victoria. 55,000 people have been tested in the past 24 hours across Australia. There has regrettably been one additional death, taking the national uh, death toll to 123 from COVID-19. There are 156 people currently hospitalised with coronavirus disease, 33 of whom are in intensive care units. The vigorous contact tracing that is going on at the moment across Victoria and New South Wales, assisted by contact tracers at the Commonwealth and in many other states and territories working remotely to help support our colleagues in Victoria, is being backed up by a remarkable testing uh, framework. We have tested over 55,000 Australians in the past 24 hours, um, the vast bulk of those in Victoria and New South Wales. It is that ability um, to test rapidly, uh, to turn around results rapidly and to identify cases of COVID-19, then to identify contacts and make sure that people are isolated. These are the key elements uh, of getting COVID-19 uh, back under control in Australia at the moment. Time for my afternoon panel, Liberal MP Katie Allen and Shadow Secret Cabinet Secretary on the Labor side of politics, Jenny McAllister. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hello, PK. Let's start with you, Katie Allen. There is a debate around whether Australia should be pursuing eradication and suppression of coronavirus. In fact, I've spoken to a professor and former Greens leader who's also a sort of medical doctor 
today on the program, both arguing for eradication. Katie, I know you're in favour of suppression, so level with us. What does suppression look like? Are we going to continue to see these lockdowns? Is that just living with COVID-19? What does it look like practically for Australians? Well, let me be clear, there's a difference between eradication and elimination. So aggressive suppression will lead to elimination, which means a low or zero case rate, while eradication means that um, uh, while this global pandemic is raging around the world, and unless it either burns its way out naturally, as is done with previous SARS and theirs, or we have a vaccine, we actually can't defend ourselves completely from the rest of the world unless we completely disconnect. And that's both impractical and not likely to happen. So the most important thing is we had a plan at the start of this pandemic, and that plan was to aggressively suppress. And as you can see in other states and territories, it is extremely effective. Now, there's been a breakdown in service delivery here in Victoria, unfortunately, and that has resulted in a breakout here in Melbourne. So we do need to contain it with aggressive tracing and tracking and ensuring that the public comes with us with regards to physical distancing, hand hygiene and now masks. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is the plan worked at the start. It continues to work. And as long as service delivery with regards to quarantining continues, it is the right plan. It's an economically and sound plan from a health point of view. Jenny McAllister, what's your view on this? Katie say, I think that the differences between eradication, elimination and aggressive suppression are fine differences uh, observed in the medical community. I'm not sure that the community quite understands the trajectory that we're on. I think it's really important that our leaders, particularly those leaders that are being regularly briefed by the health professionals, are talking to people about exactly what our goals are and how we're going to get there. We need to be listening to the health advice. There's no point people like me making it up. But I do think that we need to share as much as we can with the community about where we're going. We know that the community is capable of working together to protect one another, but that only happens if we take everybody into our trust. I think it's really important that there be very strong communication from the Prime Minister and all of the state premiers, particularly at this time. Katie, if I can bring you back in, was it a mistake not to recommend the widespread wearing of face masks like earlier in the pandemic? There was this discussion about whether we should be wearing them. We kept getting told the health advice was not to wear them. Now, apparently, we must wear them in Melbourne. Was that a blunder? No, no, not at all. In fact, I think that's the point. The last four months has been an excellent plan and we haven't wasted anything, really, with regards to where we've got to. The breakdown has been in quarantining. In fact, with masks, I will say, I'm a little bit concerned about this step about mandatory masks in Melbourne because I really hope we have the social licence to bring the community along. It's very important that when we have a public health recommendation that everybody does do it. And the point with masks is that when you have a very low prevalence in the general community, uh, people uh, will not necessarily use the mask correctly. They won't come along with us and, and do it in a very consistent way. Now, Australia tends to res respond very you know, uh, reflexively to the US. You know, they say that when America sneezes, we get a cold. And it is interesting, in uh, the early aspects of this pandemic, masks were not recommended by the CDC, which is the expert committee uh, in the US. Suddenly, we're doing it here in Victoria. I would argue that the most important thing we can do as a public is physical distancing and hand hygiene. If you cannot physically distance, then you should use a mask. And I think that's the important thing, rather than masks at every point. It's really when you can't physically distance. So we're in stage three lockdown, just to stay at home. If you're going shopping and you're in close contact with other people, a mask is an extra precaution. But the physical distance is the most important precaution. Uh, of course, but just to pick you up on what you, you said, you, you're against this decision, are you saying, by the Andrews government to require people to wear masks? Look, I believe as, as governments we should all work together and stick together. So I will back in Premier Andrews' recommendation for mandatory masks. But I want the public to hear loud and clear that this is the third line of defence the public has to do. The first one is public, sorry, physical distancing. Second is hand hygiene. And the third is wearing a mask when you can't physically distance. Well, you have to wear Premier it, Andrews though. It's not, I don't know if it's the third line, mandatory. because legally it's, it's the He's law. He's decided to make it mandatory. I back him in on this. I personally wish that it wasn't mandatory for everything. Like you, you can, you can, you don't, you shouldn't wear, you don't have to wear one when you run, but you do when you walk. But that being said, I'm not going to argue around the 
around the edges here. It is really important that we make sure that everyone comes on this journey and if he believes that this important next step at this point, then that's fine. But it is important that we're all working together and we are seeing the numbers starting to come down. The track and trace is probably the most important second step after quarantining. And that now has a good set of experts now. We've thrown everything at this situation to get it under control. And we need the public's trust to come on this journey as well. Just briefly on the economic response, which is coming on Thursday, uh, there are reports about a tapering down or a sort of more targeted approach to job seeker, job keeper. Uh, clearly, there's a ne the next phase the government's moving to. Jenny McAllister, isn't that reasonable that you'd need a next phase? Clearly, the government's not going to turn the tap off. A couple of things there, Patricia. We have been arguing for a redesign of JobKeeper to make it more targeted for some time. We've been concerned that in some instances, some people were receiving significantly more through JobKeeper than they might have been uh, under their ordinary conditions when they were working. But the key here is actually about giving some certainty. The government signalled for a very long time that they were going to turn the tap off in September. Now they seem to be indicating that they're going to do something else. There are millions of businesses and families dependent on this payment. And at the moment, they have got absolutely no idea what's going on in September. And if you don't think that that's a drag on economic confidence and a drag on the economic circumstances of the country, you're kidding yourself. We need some certainty, and this has been a very long time in coming. Katie, Thursday's sort of decision day, or at least telling us what the decision is, I'm sure many of them have already been made, but you are an MP in Victoria and Melbourne where it's incredibly difficult at the moment. How important is it that the government keeps very generous supports uh, in the economy given the downturn we're seeing, particularly in your home state? Look, I think it's pretty clear that everyone understands that this is a long-term game that we're playing. And I completely disagree with Jenny about not having certainty. The one thing the Prime Minister has said from the very start, he's been very clear that this is a long-term game. He said six months and then we'll review it. There are many world leaders that said it was going to be two weeks, that they were going to do lockdown and it would be all over in two weeks. He took the long game, which is we need certainty and we need to be very careful in the decisions that we make. Now, he made a pretty dramatic decision to roll out JobKeeper and JobSeeker in a very quick period of time. I mean, these, these um, social supports have been rolled out in an amazingly short period of time. They've been highly effective, really well supported by the community. And I think there is general consensus that they have definitely helped to push in the economic blow. Now, I personally believe that going forward, there are changes that we can make, and we will hear about those on Thursday. They need to be targeted. They need to be proportional and they need to support those um, sectors that are doing it tough. And, you know, it's very hard to make decisions um, in a emerging and evolving uh, global, global pandemic that has never been seen at this scale before in the modern world. So I think that we should really be, you know, very sort of secure that the certainty around the economic decisions are being very carefully considered. And Thursday will be an important day for Australia, but the next six months, of economic decisions will be important decisions for the wealth and prosperity of Australia. And I, I think that we're heading in the right direction. We're listening broadly. Um, and I really feel quite confident that the Australian public is happy with where we're being led. Thank you to both of you. Um, we will meet again. Liberal MP Katie Allen and Shadow Cabinet Secretary on the Labor side of politics, Jenny McAllister. And there's some breaking news now and parishioners who attended a church in Sydney's West last week have been told to self-isolate for 14 days after two more positive cases of COVID-19. A person who contracted coronavirus as part of the Thai Rock restaurant cluster attended the Our Lady of Lebanon Cathedral in Harris Park on, on the three days before being diagnosed. Two Two more parishioners who attended on the same days have now tested positive for COVID-19. Moving overseas now, in a wide-ranging interview, US President Donald Trump has reiterated his view that one day the coronavirus will just disappear. With the highest death toll in the world and new COVID-19 infections running at over 70,000 a day, the US President has defended his handling of the pandemic. I think we have one of the lowest mortality it's rates true, in the sir. world. We, well, we, we're going we to take have, a look. We had 900 deaths on a single day. We will this, take a look. This week. Ready? I, you you or, can check you it out. Could you please get me the mortality rate? We'd have some early number, number one low mortality rate. Yeah.
Mr Trump also refused to give a clear answer on whether he would accept this year's election results. It came as rapper-turned-presidential candidate Kanye West held his first campaign rally wearing a bulletproof vest, ranting against social media, pornography and abortion and at one point breaking down in tears. Angie Nixon is a Democratic candidate for the Florida House and I spoke to her a little earlier about the ongoing situation in the United States. Angie Nixon, welcome. Thank you for having me. You tested positive for coronavirus two weeks ago. Can you tell us about that experience? Yes, I definitely can. Um, it's been very nerve wracking um, considering the fact that I am pregnant. <laughs> um, I'm also campaigning for office, which is just one of the least opportune times for this to happen. Um, I've been really safe about what I've been doing. Uh, just so happens that someone <laughs> came into my space. They weren't wearing a mask. We were wearing masks and we traced it back to them. And it's really unfortunate uh, considering the fact that we don't know if there's going to be any type of side effects as it relates to uh, my unborn baby. And it's just really frustrating that there's been a total lack of regard um, and just politics being played as it relates to the Republicans here in the United States and especially the state of Florida. Let's talk about some of that politics, particularly in relation to mask wearing, which has become a political issue in the United right. States. Uh, some attempts even here in Australia where it's become mandatory in, in Melbourne to wear it for it to become politicised as well. Tell me about the politics on this, how this is playing out. <laughs> So it's it's absurd. Of course, it's election season. It's a big election year. We have a presidential election coming up. And it's become very political here in Jacksonville. We realize that uh, Donald Trump, if he does not win Florida, he's not going to win uh, the election. And so he has uh, pretty much maneuvered his way. Uh, our mayor, Mayor Lenny Curry, is actually the former uh, head of the, the Republican Party across the state. And so he knows and realizes that Donald Trump needs to win Florida. And so he offered up our city to host the RNC convention, which is ridiculous, especially since Florida is a hotbed for COVID cases. And what's really interesting is that my my smoothie shop, my smoothie and sandwich shop that I opened with my now 13 year old daughter is only four blocks away from the RNC convention. And so safety is a, a very big issue for us here as it relates to this massive spread and the fact that the cases are skyrocketing and not just in Florida, but also in Duval County. And we're really concerned not only about our, our community health wise, but also just about the physical safety of folks that are so polarizing coming to our city. That's and and as a business owner, I have still yet to hear from our mayor Lenny Curry in regards to what's going to happen security wise. We don't know anything. And I've been saying this for months and months and months. Tell us what the plan is, what the security perimeter is going to be. And then also, what are you going to do since there are these huge spikes that are happening in regards to COVID? President Trump claimed in his latest interview that Florida's cases will come under control and repeated his assertion that the virus will eventually disappear. That's despite Florida reporting over 12,000 new cases of COVID-19. Now, the fifth day in a row that the state has announced over 10,000 new infections. What do you make of these points that the president is making about the virus, particularly as it pertains to Florida? It is just absurd that he is putting our health and safety in jeopardy and just the mere fact that our statewide emergency operation center had to shut down because there were numerous cases of COVID uh, positive folks being tested there. And so you have to think about that. If they're shutting down the emergency operation system, a, a place where adults 
who are supposed to know how to handle themselves in a case of emergency. What are we gonna, what, what is that saying about us trying to force our children to go back to school so soon and then to hold a Republican National Convention here? It's just absurd. Let's talk about your own personal, uh, you know, experience with COVID. As you say, you're pregnant. I'm not, I forgot how many weeks it is, but you're, you're pretty pregnant, is my I understanding. I am. I'm going <laughs> on, I think, like 34 weeks now. Pretty yes. pregnant. Okay, let's let's establish <laughs> pretty that. Pretty pregnant. Uh, you were diagnosed with COVID-19. What kind of uh, impacts has it had on your own personal health? And what kind of advice right. have you been given about um, giving birth, uh, what it means for the child? all of those issues so it's been very <laughs> it's ve it's been very frustrating um and disheartening and just i i have mild case a mild case uh however um i've been having issues with breathing there was one point where i was actually coughing up blood <laughs> excuse me, I cough uh, when I talk for too long. I still cough, and I'm coming in on the tail end of this, so they say. Um, and I'm just always out of breath, excuse me, and just shivering, um, having chills, and just body aches. There was a few days that I just really could not move. Um, and then not, not only that, but just thinking about mentally <laughs> it's just been v very hard on me um not and the doctors don't know what the effects are going to be on the on my on my daughter um and so that's what's even more frustrating and just having to deal with the fact that I haven't been able to see my 13 year old in weeks um we just talk on the phone my fiance came over the other day. We were talking through a glass door. And so I can only imagine just <laughs> what's going to happen. Just even thinking about after you have a baby, sometimes moms go to, through postpartum, but just being very fearful of what is happening to my daughter or if there's any issues going on right now. So I'm, I'm just nervous. I'm really nervous. And I would love if people would wear masks. There's no reason for us not to have a statewide, a, a countrywide mandate until we get this under control. Let's talk about the impact this is having, particularly on poorer communities and African-American communities. Mm -hmm. It's something I know you've mm -hmm. been uh, passionate about. What kind of... Right. How is it affecting uh, vulnerable communities in a way that it's not affecting, I suppose, uh, white Americans the same way? Right. So there's a lot of underlying issues in uh, the black and brown communities, especially just because we have a lack of access to healthy food options and things like that. So, of course, we have health disparities, major health disparities that are only exacerbated because of this. And so it's very frustrating. And not only that, it's just also the, the lack of health uh, access, access to health care. And so one of the, we had been demanding for a while for them to start having more testing sites located in low income communities. And that's probably, that's also one of the reasons um, that we're seeing so many positives as well is because now we're getting tested. But again, there's because of the lack of access to healthy foods, to health care, to masks, um, and things like that, we are getting the tail end of it. And then to just again be being forced to go back to school so soon. And I do understand that a lot of parents are having to work. And so we just have to think outside the box. These elected officials need to start thinking outside the box in regards to just how we can ensure that our children, ensure that the parents, ensure that our teachers are safe, um, safe for us to make sure that um, when it's time to go back to school, uh, they won't be exposed to COVID. Just finally, the pandemic is happening with the backdrop of the Black Lives Matter protests across the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that that movement, I mean, in terms of the numbers on the streets, has, of course, dissipated. How much is this movement still in the, in the backdrop and how much have things oh. changed? 
oh wow so it is not in the backdrop <laughs> it is still in the forefronts of our, of our minds especially in the black community it's so unfortunate that we are often in so many fights for our lives we're fighting for our lives to ensure um that we aren't being victims of systemic racism, especially at the hands of police brutality. Now we're fighting for our lives in regards to just our health and just the lack of healthcare access that we have. And now is the time that our elected officials really need to step up and learn that we we are tired of surviving. The black and brown communities in our country, we're tired of surviving. It's time for us to be able to thrive. They need to start putting money into infrastructure, into ensuring that we have access to health care, making sure that public education is fully funded and just so much more. But the Black Lives Matter movement is not going away. Um, we are still, we are a resilient people. The black community is a resilient people. We come from, we, we help build this country. And so we're going to keep fighting and keep, uh, uplifting these issues that are happening in our community. And I think that we're going to start seeing a shift in August here in Florida. We have um, upcoming elections. We're going to start seeing a shift in August as well as November because people are tired of just getting lip service. We actually have to start making systemic change for the better of our communities. Angie, thank you so much for joining us and um, good luck with the birth of your daughter. Thank you for having me. That was Democratic candidate for the Florida House, Angie Nixon, talking about how the US has responded to the pandemic. She's also been diagnosed with COVID-19 and is 34 weeks pregnant. Recapping this week's, uh, this day's uh, breaking news and parishioners who attended a church in Sydney's West last week have been told to self-isolate for 14 days after two more positive COVID cases. A person who contracted coronavirus as part of the Thai rock restaurant cluster attended the Our Lady of Lebanon Cathedral in Harris Park on the three days before being diagnosed. Two more parishioners who attended on the same day have now tested positive for COVID-19. And that's the up-to-date news here on the ABC. You can keep up to date on ABC News Online or on iView. And, of course, Afternoon Briefing is also on iView. Just search for us by looking up Afternoon Briefing. I'll be back at 4pm tomorrow. Stay with us here on ABC News. Today, Italy has passed a deadly milestone.